Hi everyone and welcome back to the fourth video in this discipleship strategy. The theme of this video today is going to be all about gospel living. How do we live as children of God? What do our Christian lives look like to the world around us? And inwardly in our private life as well, what should that look like? But before we start, we need to clarify something really important here that we are not saved, we are not made righteous through our own deeds, through our own works, for our own righteousness, because Christianity is not legalistic. We are entirely reliant on Christ's work on the cross, on his imputed righteousness that is given to us. For on the cross, all of our sin, all of our muck is given to him, and he gives us all of his righteousness. So it's not down to what I do, before God that makes me holy. It's not down to what I can achieve in this life and how many battles I can win with sin that will make me stand upright before God. No, it is what he has done for me that matters at the foundation. So Christianity is not legalistic. We cannot climb the ladder up to God through our own works and deeds. We are entirely reliant on what he has done. But the Bible tells us that we are called to holiness. We are called to live holy lives, to live lives that are pleasing before God. We are not saved by our good deeds, but we are saved for good deeds. And our new freedom in Christ does not give us license to sin. It doesn't give us the license to keep on living in the way that we did before we became Christians. Instead, the essential mark of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us is that we change, that we become more Christ-like, that we start to fight battles against the sinful nature, that we start to win these battles. In Hebrews 12 verse 14, it says, we are to be holy, for without holiness, no one will see the Lord. We are to be holy, for without holiness, no one will see the Lord. John Piper writes that killing sin is not optional. This is mortal combat. Sin dies or we die. We must refuse to settle in with sin. There is a real battle going on here. This is spiritual warfare and we need to be ready for the fight. We are saved for good deeds. We are saved so we can live holy lives. We are to put off that old self that we wore before we became a Christian. That old self that was corrupted with evil desires, with lusts, desires of the flesh. And we are to put on the new self that we're going to see in the second half of this video. When we display the fruit of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. If we look through Romans 6, it's very clear that because we are in union with Jesus Christ, we must no longer live in the flesh anymore to live according to the uh, desires of the flesh. We must count ourselves as dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's Romans 6, 11. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 and 20, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. See, in the Christian life, there is a real call to lay down our lives, our old selves, to lay them down. We are dead to them and we are to live as those of the Holy Spirit. For the Holy Spirit changing us from within so that we start to fight and lay down our sinful desires and lay down the sinful flesh for it has been crucified with Christ. And what I want to do in this section of the video is talk you through some practical tips for fighting sin. So I'm going to jump away from me here. I'm going to put a little sermon extract I did a couple of months ago where I talked through seven tips for fighting sin. I hope it's helpful. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. He's trying to tell us something here, isn't it? We have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, 
you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Something very serious is at stake in this in these couple of verses. Paul's talking about our fight with the sinful nature. Because so I don't know if you've noticed that you become a Christian, the sinful nature is still trying to pull away at you, isn't it? Trying to get you to sin, to give in to the desires of the flesh. It doesn't disappear. I wish it does. I wish it did. I really wish it did. But we are still pulled by our sinful nature, aren't we? And this passage just shows us how important fighting sin is. It's not an optional add-on in the Christian life. It's not like, oh, we're saved, we're justified, therefore we can do whatever we like because one day we're going to heaven and Jesus will just forgive us of everything if we carry on living in the sinful flesh. No, we see that living according to the flesh leads to death, which is eternal separation from God. If we make that continuous choice to keep on living by the flesh. Now, I don't think Paul is expecting sinless perfection this side of eternity. But what he is saying is that we need to be in a battle. We need to be fighting against our sinful nature, putting it to death through the spirit. And I wanted to give you, most people have a three point seven here. I've got seven tips for fighting sin. They're quite short. They're quite short. Seven practical tips for fighting sin. The first one is be encouraged that you are already dead to sin if you are in Christ Jesus. Be encouraged. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The decisive victory has already been won. Jesus has won that ultimate victory on the cross. And therefore, the only sin that you can successfully defeat is a forgiven sin, a sin that has already been dealt with on the cross. That's encouraging, isn't it, in our battle against sin, that Christ has already won the war. We're fighting these little battles, but the war has been won. So be encouraged that you are already dead to sin. The decisive victory has already taken place on the cross. That's the first point. But secondly, we must develop a hatred for sin. You don't put to death your friends, but your enemies. You know, we must develop a hatred for sin. I think sometimes sin can be so appealing. It can be so enticing that we hold on to it, that we hold on to it. There's those little sins that we keep, we put them in the closet and we keep holding on to them. But we must develop a hatred for sin if we're going to put it to death. Remember that sin is the reason that Jesus had to go to the cross. That's how much he hates it. And that's how much we must hate it as well. We must develop a hatred for sin if we're going to successfully defeat it. But point number three, we must seek after higher and greater pleasures. If we're going to fight sin successfully, we must see Jesus Christ as more precious, more glorious than the sin that tempts us. We must seek after higher and greater pleasures. And fourthly, we mustn't give sin an open door. Now, this is going to mean different things for you to me. We all know the situations that we're in and the sin that can entice us. And therefore, we need to put practical things in place if we're going to defeat that sin. It'll be different depending on what your situation is. But we must not give sin an open door. We must put practical things in place if we're going to combat our sin. We must make deliberate plans to flee from temptation where possible. In Romans 13 verse 14, Paul writes that we must make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. We must make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Don't give sin an open door. Try and put practical things in place that will help you to flee from temptation. Point number five is be accountable to someone. There is strength in numbers. We don't have to do this on our own. You don't have to fight this as an individual locked away in a closet. We can work together and encourage one another in the fight against sin. Find yourself a Christian friend who you're willing to be accountable to, willing to open up and share what you struggle with. There is strength in numbers and that'll help us win in this battle. Point number six though is beware of your fight becoming legalistic. Always think about what is your motivation for fighting 
sin. Remember, we are not saved by keeping God's law, by trying to climb the ladder. We are saved by grace through faith by Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. So our warfare should be a work of faith, not as a legalistic way of trying to earn God's grace. It must be the overflow of our love for Christ. And lastly, we can fight sin because of who we are in Christ. The last few verses of our passage, verse 14 onwards, tells us who we are if we are in Christ. We can fight sin because of who we are in Christ. Let me read verses 14 to 17. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. That is who we are. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So the last point here is that we fight sin or we can fight sin because of who we are in Jesus Christ. We are sons of the king. How encouraging is that when we're in these battles? We don't fight sin so that we can become children of God. We fight sin because we are children of God. That is who we are. And if we suffer with him, we will share in his glory. So in those battles with sin, we need to keep perspective. We need to remember who we are. We need to keep our eyes upon Jesus. We need to look up as much as we look down. We need to look up and see who we are in Jesus Christ. He is far more satisfying than anything sin can offer. Sin can offer temporary, shallow pleasures. But Christ offers deep, satisfying, eternal pleasure, far greater than anything sin can offer. So at this point in the video, I want you to pause. There's going to be a list of reflective questions on the screen. And I want you to think them through, to discuss them if you're doing this in small groups or to think them through if you're doing it individually. And the first one is, are you actively fighting your sin? Are you actually in warfare against the sinful nature or are you being passive to it? Are you letting sin slide in your Christian life? But if you are fighting sin, then what is the motive? Why are you doing it? What is the purpose for you fighting sin? Is it a work of faith? Or is it a legalistic battle as if you're trying to climb that ladder back up to God through your good deeds and your holy living? And thirdly, then, if you are fighting, what strategies have you put in place in your fight against sin? What practical measures are you doing in your Christian life? It's so important that we actually put proper strategies in place so that we fight Everyone has their own temptations, their own desires. You know yourself better than I do. And you've got to think, well, what practically can I do to fight my sinful nature? And then question number four, do you hate your sin? Or is it your secret best friend? We really need to be people that hate our sin, that are repulsed by it, that remember that it is the reason that Jesus went to the cross because of our sin. We need to hate our sin. It needs to be our enemy. And then fifthly, do we value Christ as more precious than any earthly pleasure? When we're tempted by that sin, do we see Christ as more precious? Do we see him as more beautiful than what that sin is? We need to be people that value Christ above all things. And how aware are you of Jesus being Lord of your life? Can you see the changes starting to take place? Do you live for yourself or do you live for Jesus Christ? Really tough questions, guys. But it's worth taking the time to reflect, to discuss and to pray over these questions. So in this uh, second half of the video, we're going to look at what the Christian life looks like practically to the world around us in terms of the way that we live. So what this life should look like to the world around us. And the main theme of this second half of the video is going to be looking at fruit. 
are we displaying fruit that the Holy Spirit has changed us from within? We've already looked at one of the fruits, self-control, fighting sin, uh, but we're going to look at some of the others now. And the first passage I want to go to can be found in Matthew chapter 12, verse 33, where Jesus is talking about a tree. And he says, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. That's what the Christian life should be, isn't it? That if we are a good tree, then we will get good fruit. But make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. And then this is the key bit for a tree is recognized by its fruit. Really key passage there. Are we recognized as children of God by the fruit that we are displaying in our lives, in the way that we live? And the Apostle Paul picks this up in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Let me just read a couple of verses, 22 and 23, where he's talking about the fruit of the Spirit. So the fruit that we have been changed and that the Holy Spirit is dwelling within us. And it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit moves within, there has to be changes. What I want you to do is to take some time now to read through slowly that passage again, to weigh yourself up against those different fruit, to pray to God about it, to thank him for the areas in your life where you are becoming more Christ-like, where you can recognize that fruit. So pray in thanksgiving for those things, but also pray for the things where your life doesn't measure up, where you're struggling to live like that, and ask for the Holy Spirit to help you in this. So I want you to take a bit of time now just reflecting on that list that was in Galatians chapter 5. And as we come to a close, we're going to undergo another spiritual assessment like we've done in the other videos. So on your screen at the moment, there should be 10 statements. And what I'd like you to do is to work through those statements slowly, either by yourself or in a group, if you're doing this in house group or in in a friendship group, take each of those statements and score yourself one through to five, where five is always and one is never. And just reflect prayerfully on those statements and ask the Holy Spirit to help you to grow if there's any that you feel that you're Uh, deficient in or that you want to grow in more and as we close this video I think it'd be really good if we prayed together about the things that we've been looking at. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord we thank you so much that we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus, that we are declared righteous before you, not because of our works and deeds but because of what Christ has done for us. Oh we thank you and we praise you for that. And then, Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit does dwell within the heart of the believer, that you change us from within to become more like Jesus. But Lord, I pray that you would help us to display that to the world through the way that we live. Help us to not live in a way that is just the same as the world, but help us to live in a way that shows that you have changed us that we are people who want to fight our sin, that we are people that are displaying fruit, love, joy, patience, forbearance to this world around us. Lord, I pray that you would change us to become more like your son, the Lord Jesus. In your mighty name, amen.